At this point, I'm starting to collect enough icebergs that I could put one on each finger. Hello, I'm Dr. Skipper, and this is the PBS Kids Iceberg. The iceberg is made by Daisy's Real 99 and covers cartoon shows and controversies covered on PBS Kids. Look, you might not know me, and I might not know you, but an iceberg is a tier list of the most common trivia to the least known. But a majority of this is ear candy, so I suggest you let this play in the background and do something productive, like draw, play a video game, clean your room, or do your homework. But let's be real, we both know you aren't doing that. Or hey, even let this plane go to sleep to the sound of a pretentious bird with crisp audio. I also have other icebergs in the description for you to watch as well as my other content that you could watch as well. Also, if you subscribe to the channel, that would be nice, but I recommend you wait till the end and make up your mind then. But hey, if you like to cut lines and take shortcuts, just subscribe now and like the video. Also, a YouTube channel named The Whole My Garden is assisting me with some of these layers, so I recommend you check out his channel as well in the description. But before we start, a word from our sponsor. Stop that clicking! Sorry, my good old companion, I'm just in distress because I cannot be like my inspiration, Jordan Belford, because I can't access The Wolf of Wall Street on my Netflix subscription due to it not being available in the United States. That's crazy because I just finished watching all seasons of The US Office and The Wolf of Wall Street, and now I've made half a million dollars in the stock market. You see, I used Atlas VPN, and currently Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their three year deal for just $139 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee. T. Atlas VPN is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location. So you're saying I could be as toxic as I want in a Call of Duty lobby without having to fear hostile DDoS attacks? Are people finding my IP address? Yes, Atlas VPN changes your encryption key, making you safe and sound. Also, Atlas VPN can help you get access to geo-locked apps such as Disney+, Plus, Netflix, and HBO Max. Is that why there's so much footage of James Gunn's The Suicide Squad in this video? Yes, because I'm British and I don't have HBO Max. And with Atlas VPN, I can watch Pete Davidson die. Spoilers, man. But with Atlas VPN, you can set your location at anywhere in the grand old United Kingdom or anywhere else in the world with a click of a button and watch all the exclusive content you want. Oh my God, I can now watch The Wolf of Wall Street and the US office since it's not available in the United States and a click of a button with Atlas VPN. And anyone in the United States could do the same vice versa. Yes. It's also supported on all devices. Wow, that's awesome, Rocket. I'm gonna click the link in the description and access all the GeoLock content safely. And currently, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their three-year deal for just $139 per month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. The deal won't last for long. Make sure to check it out by clicking the description. Thank you, Atlas VPN, for sponsoring the video and putting food in my bowl for this month. All right, back to editing. And you go back to the iceberg. Bark, bark, or something. All right. Stop and Go Stop and Go was an online writing activity seen on the former website of PBS Kids Go, a block much like PBS Kids that was aimed toward a slightly older audience, and was mainly aired weekday afternoons on the PBS station from 2004 to 2013. In 2013, a newer rebrand for PBS Kids was rolled out the stations, ultimately getting rid of the block. The Stop and Go game, however, was removed a few years prior to 2013. On the Stop and Go game, kids could write their own story on the website after seeing the Stop and Go commercial to finish their own version of the particular story. Maya begins writing a story in which Arthur and Buster are walking outside when they see a fort and inside they find Binky covered in some kind of goo. Maya then tells the viewers she wants them to finish the story and what was Binky covered in and why. It's good that they encourage kids to use their imaginations and come up with their own stories, but the fact that it involves Binky covered in mysterious goo may be inappropriate. It also may raise some eyebrows or cause some older viewers to make some inappropriate suggestions. Bearstein Bears, Tuffy is abused. Tuffy first appeared in The Bearstein Bears and the Bully. She is shown to be extremely aggressive and beats up Sister on the playground while Sister's friends watch in dismay. She attempted to fight Sister a second time when Sister caught her throwing rocks at a baby bird that was unable to fly. But Sister had learned some self-defense from Brother and managed to beat Tuffy up by hitting her square in the nose, causing Tuffy's nose to bleed. Their fight is witnessed by a recess monitor who takes them to Mr. Honeycomb's office. While the two girls are waiting outside the principal's office, Sister Bear notices that Tuffy's crying and questions her on it. Tuffy tearfully claims to Sister that she's really worried about what her parents will do if they find out what happened. Tuffy then claims if her parents find out, she won't be able to sit down for a long time. After hearing this, Sister realized that Tuffy must have a rough home life, and that must be one of the big reasons to why she's a bully. In the end, a second recess monitor who happens to witness Sister and Tuffy's fight comes in and reveals to the principal that Sister was trying to defend a little bird that Tuffy was hurting. Sister Bear is ultimately let off with a warning. As for Tuffy, the principal doesn't call Tuffy's parents about what happened, but she's forced to serve recess detentions for a week and ends up having to see the school counselor for a while. By the way, if you watch Bearstein Bears, please let me know in the comments. 
JJ the Jet Plane. JJ the Jet Plane is American live action slash CGI animated musical children television series that was based at the fictional Terrytown Airport. The series has 62 episodes and is centered on a group of aircraft who live in the fictional city of Terrytown. The episodes are around 25 minutes long. Also, each episode contains one or more songs. The theme song and the majority of the other songs were written by well-known children's singer slash songwriter Stephen Michael Schwartz and sung by his popular music group, Parachute Express. Created by Devin and Deborah Mitchell, the series is intended to be educational to teach life and moral lessons to children. Original series. In late 1994, a short live action series was produced at AMS Production Company in Dallas, Texas, with real life model planes and handcrafted human characters. They had the same personalities later in the series. The original series had a lot of similarities to the first couple seasons of Thomas and Friends, also with Theodore Tugboat. Three videos were released, JJ's first flight in December 1994, Old Oscars led the parade in February 1995, and Tracy's handout hideout in October 1996. The original series was narrated by and features some voices of John William Gout. These three were known as the pilot series. CGI and live action based episodes. On November 2nd, 1998, the CGI animated says live action series premiered on the Learning Channel as part of the Ready Set Learn block. Voice actress Mary Kay Bergman provided the original voice of JJ, Herky, Savannah, and Revan Even. After her death, Debbie Derry Berry and Donna Cherry replaced her. In 2005, new episodes were produced featuring additional characters, including the Red Latina plane, Lena. Each episode begins featuring JJ's mystery segment in which JJ and Lena explore things that may be mysterious to intended age groups, such as how planes fly or how the five senses are used. The mystery segment is followed by a story that comes up from the original episodes of the series. So in effect, the new series repackages previously broadcasted content, the reboot. A reboot of the series titled The New World of JJ Jet Plane has been confirmed, and it's a complete redesign made to look more cartoony to fit the you know newer audience of children. I never grew up with JJ the Jet Plane, or maybe anything on here, but if you did, please let me know down below more about your experiences with it. I actually will find that really interesting. Ghost Rider. Not to get confused with Ghost Rider like the Marvel property, I mean actual Ghost Rider, like a typewriter. So Ghost Rider is an American children's mystery television series created by Liz Nealon and produced by the Children's Television Workshop and British BBC Television. <laughs> BBC. The series itself aired during BBC's Two Schools Input. It began airing on PBS on October 4th, 1992, and the final episode aired on February 12th, 1995. The series revolves around a group of friends from Brooklyn who solve neighborhood crimes and mysteries as a team of youth detectives with the help of a ghost named Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider could communicate with children only by manipulating whatever text and letters he could find, and using them to make words and sentences. The series was designed to teach reading and writing skills to school children. Each mystery was presented as a case, covering four 30-minute episodes. Children were encouraged to follow each mystery and use the reading and writing clues given to attempt to solve mysteries just like the Ghost Rider team does in the TV series. Ghost Rider was critically acclaimed and honored by presenting a realistic, ethically diverse world in the two-hour mystery stories. By the end of its third season, Ghost Rider ranked in the top five of all children's shows on American television. Ghost Rider has been broadcast in 24 countries worldwide and generated a number of foreign language adaptations, including a dubbed over version on Discovery Kids Latin America marketed as Phantasma Escritor. Oh, I butchered the shit out of that. Sorry, me amigos. My bad. Despite its popularity, the program was abruptly canceled after its third season due to inadequate funding. The original series was re-ran from 1995 to 1999 on PBS. The UPN Kids block in the UPN also has reruns from a short time in 1997. Then in 1999, it was syndicated on ABC for a short time. From 1999 to 2003, it was aired on Noggin Cable Network, which was jointly funded by the Children's Television Workshop with Viacom's Nickelodeon. The show's revival, The New Ghost Rider Mysteries, also aired on Noggin as part of its nighttime programming block, The Hubbub. Any of you dinosaurs or old fossils who watch this, please tell me below. I'm a 2000s kid, so I don't know much about this. <laughs> Caillou has cancer theory. Jesus Christ. So this is something from a theory about Caillou having cancer. I'll read it out for you. Why is Caillou bald? People have wondered about this ever since Caillou was a thing. And why are his parents always so calm and why is Caillou so whiny? Either his parents are obsessed with his looks or they secretly abused him by shaving his head. This theory says that Caillou is actually a toddler with cancer. The reason why there's always a white frame board on the show is because Caillou is on his deathbed and the stories are Caillou's fantasies of his ideal life or just flashbacks. Caillou's cancer could also be the reason his parents spoil him because they want to give him happy memories before he passes away, and they feel guilty of punishing him because of his disease. Or in another way, Caillou died before the series started, and the narrator simply telling stories of her grandson to the two kids. Another theory could be that Caillou never had cancer and instead was born with a gene that prevents him from growing hair. Or his growth of hair is very slow and it might take years until he starts growing hair. So there's been mentions that the true reason Caillou is bald is because he was originally an infant in the books, and they wanted to keep him recognizable to children. Furthermore, the original voice actress of Caillou, Jackie, 
Linsky died in a car crash in 2003. Okay, I guess Riff, I I didn't add that. They just added that she died in a car crash in 2003. I guess rest in peace, I don't really know, but it pretty much confirms that he doesn't have cancer. You know, there's some people who will still believe it, but you know what, if he does have cancer, big ups Caillou. Also, <laughs> rip to the voice actor who <laughs> just got somehow mentioned that she, in there at the end. I, I'm, I'm laughing because it's just so random, not because she died in a car crash, rest in peace. But that's the end of the first layer. I'm gonna be moving on to layer two now, but I guess thanks for sticking with this one. All right, I'll see you there. Super Y versus Proto the Antivirus. So this is based on a series of YouTube remixes based on an Indian antivirus software, Protogen. So the advertisements have been criticized for their animation, the characters, and song choice, which features a rap about software. Many online have claimed that the antivirus is malware because of the character of Proto looks very similar to Wyatt from the animated children's series Super Y. On August 18th, 2013, the YouTube account for Uninstall, Protogen's parent company, uploaded a three minute commercial of their Protogen software. In the video, four cartoon men discuss their issues before being approached by Proto, Protogen's superhero mascot. As of August 2017, the video has been viewed 5,500 times. The following year, February 25th, Uninstall uploaded another Proto-based commercial in which the character raps. The video is inspired by a large number of remixes involving Protogen. On September 9th, 2016, Protogen uploaded another commercial under the name Uninstall Systems PVT LTD. The commercial, which features two Protos, one with a mustache talking about the product, received more than 30,000 views in less than a year. So this is pretty much just a conflict between a knockoff Indian version of Super Y, which was promoting software. <laughs> I mean, don't download this, it's probably definitely going to destroy your PC. That's pretty funny though. Bear Stein Bears versus Bear Steen Bears. So this is a theory about the Mandela effect. The way Bernstein Bears is pronounced is Bernstein Bears, but there's a lot of people who have the presumption that was originally Bernstein Bears, S-T-E-I-N, but it's S-T-A-I-N. It's an interesting case of the Mandela effect and some are really in belief that it is Bernstein Bears. Me personally, I always remember it being Steen, it's S-T-E-I-N, that makes sense. Bear stain bears just doesn't really make sense. This might all just be bullshit, but it's incredibly interesting to look into the Mandela effect and how this works. Some people really do believe that it was originally bear stain bears, not bear stain bears. Anybody who grew up with it, can you please tell me below what's your interpretation of this? Do you remember it being S-T-E-I-N or was it always S-T-A-I-N? But I wanna hear your perspective on this. For those who grew up with it, is the Mandela effect taking place on you? Or some of you just might not even care at all. You just saw two bears and that was it. Jerry Falwell versus the Teletubbies, the Tinky Winky controversy. So a controversy arose in 1999 concerning Tinky Winky and him carrying a bag that looks much like a woman's handbag. Oh my God, we're about to go here, huh? He aroused interest at Jerry Falwell. In 1999, when Falwell alleged that the character was a gay role model, Falwell issued an attack on the National Liberty Journal, citing Washington Post in slash out column which stated that the lesbian comedian Ellen DeGeneres was out as the chief national gay representative, while trendy Tinky Winky was in. He warned parents that Tinky Winky could be a convert homosexual symbol because he is purple, the gay pride color, and his antenna is shaped like a triangle, which is the gay pride symbol. The BBC made an official response explaining that Tinky Winky is simply just a sweet technological baby with a magic bag. They also made a comment that he's not gay, he's straight, he's just a character in a children's series. In 2007, it was revisited, and an investigation was ordered. I noticed that he has a woman's handbag, but I didn't realize he's a boy, said in a public statement by Sawinska. The opinion of leading sexologists who have maintained the series has negative effects on children's psychology is perfectly credible. As a result, I've decided that it's no longer necessary to seek the opinion of other psychologists. Despite the objections, the independent of Sunday's editors included Tinky Winky was the only fictional character in 2008 on the happy list, alongside 99 real life adults recognized for making Britain a better, happier place. It's 2021, folks. It, times have changed. But that's really funny that Tinky Winky was an actual national menace for teaching kids homosexuality. Take in mind, this is 1999. That's a way different place from 2021. Tinky Winky, the homosexual menace. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, because he had a fucking handbag. That's it for layer two, though. This was a pretty short one. For layer three, though, I'm gonna be handing this off to my friend, The Hole in My Garden. He's a cool guy and he's British, so you should go subscribe to him. I'll see you guys in the fourth layer. <laughs> Bye. I've been on this channel a few times already, and a lot of you most likely remember me or have the faint glimmer of recognition that makes you say, hey, I know that guy. So I'm not gonna waste words here, I'm the whole of my garden and I'm here to cover a few layers of this iceberg. Now in case you haven't noticed, I'm not American and PBS is an American public broadcasting network, so a lot of this stuff is very unfamiliar to me. And now you're probably thinking, hey, if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about and have no clue what Sid the Science Kid is, then why are you even on this iceberg? And to that I say, um, 
Every day's a school day, like little kids did during the ancient days of television that sit cross-legged and mindlessly listen to little facts and trivia coming from a cartoon character trapped behind a screen. And let's learn some things. I inform you, you inform me. So let's start with Curious George racism. Um, okay. Let's avoid base, arguably, because of assumptions of what this topic could be referring to and actually look into this a little more. This, I guess you would call it a theory, an interpretation, it doesn't really matter. Point is, this came about as a result of an essay written by a sophomore at Boston University called Mary Turhune, titled, A Good Little Monkey. Curious George's undercurrent of white dominance in the series' continued popularity. And the series' continued popularity. This essay is pretty dense with references, arguments, and points relating to social and political context surrounding George as well as possible offensive signage, so it's not exactly the thing I can just read word for word as that's boring. But this essay is interesting, so I'll try my best to paraphrase arguments and lift quotations from the essay. Turhune calls into question some of the earlier Curious George books as examples of implicit racism. The essay states, Earlier books in the series prove probably problematic with their overt references to the abduction and forced enslavement of Africans during the slave trade, and their glorification of the man in the yellow hat who was celebrated as a friend and protector rather than condemned as a captor and oppressor. The series' celebration of the oppression of an abducted monkey parallels the oppression of black Americans, making the book's fame seemingly contradictory to the atmosphere of innocence in which modern society has deemed it necessary for children to appropriately and healthfully develop. The essay goes on to state that the books have ties to old racist propaganda of the time they were made in, or at the very least, racist stereotypes and caricatures, as the writer compares George's characterization of the black youth of the 1940s, stating that, Throughout the 1930s and early 1940s, the urban youth, especially that of the predominantly black community in Harlem, was commonly portrayed as dangerous and delinquent ridden. Riots that occurred during this time period further alienated white suburban communities from the lives and oppression of black youth with incidents such as a series of muggings and killings in the fall of 1941 by black teenagers, allowing New York newspapers to sensationalize the incidents, suggesting that the Harlem youth were out of control as the book's publication occurred in New York City and the story is thought to be set there as well. Individuals interacting with the story during this time period would, as such, subconsciously or consciously associate George with black youth. Personally, I feel like this essay is reaching. I'm the type of person who believes that everyone can have their own interpretation of something and that so long as they utilize sources to suit their argument, it is a valid perspective. However, I think this theory's reasoning is clumsy and seems to be entirely reliant on its readers ironically buying in a racist caricatures and stereotypes. I'm not denying there being a link, because I don't know, the creators of the original books are dead so we'll never know for certain. I'm also not encouraging the idea of not thinking critically in relation to kids TV shows and that everything aimed towards a younger audience is not worthy of critical thought, but I do think all Curious George boils down to is that it's a book about a monkey in New York, not a symbol for colonialism or the slave trade. But this video is sponsored and I don't want to risk anything by talking about such a controversial topic or alienate the people watching, so if you want to give your input, leave it in the comments. Barney 1997 Macy's Parade Okay, so on Thanksgiving of 1997 there was a little parade float of Barney the Dinosaur flying beautifully and gracefully through the streets like a kite on a windy field in Wales. Barney float was a mainstay of the annual Macy Parade for the past 12 years, but on that fateful day, disaster struck. Christ of the morning mass, all the humanity, all the fans are feeding around it. I told you. The cause for the Barney float dying a suicide squad death was due to high winds which caused the float to sway constantly all the while proving extremely difficult to control, leading Barney to collide with a lamppost ripping his guts open. Afterwards what started as cheers turned to a chorus of a million children watching their childhood hero die in horrific pain as he fell to the ground and was repeatedly stabbed and stepped on by the NYPD. I told that from the perspective of the Barney float being alive because not only is it funny, it also shows the sad undertones of this event. Barney was my childhood man, and I don't care how cynical you are, seeing an icon of your childhood be stomped to death by police officers is just sad. Thomas and Friends Fascist Okay, so another rabbit hole type of topic. This is referring to a New Yorker article by Gia Tolentino called The Repressive Authoritarian Soul of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. Tolentino specifically cites the episode the sad story of Henry as a sign of Sodor's fucked up totalitarian fascist undertones. The episode is pretty infamous, but to summarize, the episode begins with a train called Henry going through a short tunnel and refuses to leave, as he didn't want the rain to ruin his lovely green paint and stripes, which led to a huge incident involving all of Sodor and Thomas himself trying to get Henry to leave, which of course Henry refuses. All the while, the leader of Sodor's train, Sir Topham Hatt, stays on the sidelines doing nothing. After a lot of time and effort, Sir Topham Hatt just straight up says, 
You know what? Go fuck yourself, Henry. If you want to stay in this tunnel, then we'll get rid of your rails and build up a wall so you'll always be stuck in that tunnel. All the while looking completely terrified. Henry is trapped in there for the rest of his days, running out of steam to speak and his paint being completely eroded by time and soot from the tunnel. To which the narrator concludes, He wondered if he would ever be allowed to pull trains again. But I think he deserved his punishment. Don't you? I disagree. That punishment is like something out of I have no mouth and I must scream. But regardless, it doesn't exactly make Sodor and its residents seem as kind and welcoming as the show might make you believe. The lesson of this episode is essentially do what you're told, or be left in the darkness and die. And this isn't the only episode that has resulted in vaguely fascist punishments for troublemaking engines. In another episode, a show off engine called Smudger is converted into a generator to make him useful at last. He'll never move again. In another episode, a double-decker bus named Bulgy comes to the station and talks about revolution. He's quickly labelled a Scarlet Deceiver, trapped under a bridge and turned into a hen house. On Sodor, the steam trains engage in constant competition for big jobs, more work, and the fat controller's approval. Anthropomorphized trains in literature tend to be hard workers, but one Tumblr thread holds that Thomas and friends have other motivations. The show, canonically, takes place in a train post-apocalypse where the island of Sodor is the only safe zone in a totalitarian dystopia, in which steam trains are routinely killed and their body parts are sold or cannibalized for repair. In one of the original books the series is based off, there's a pretty grim line that talks about a place where trains are broken down, disassembled and killed. Engines on the other railway aren't safe now. Their controllers are cruel. They don't like engines anymore. They put them on cold, damp sidings and then... Percy nearly sobbed. They... they, they cut them up. The accompanying illustration features two terrified trains facing dismemberment, and behind them a train with a chilling black void where its face used to be. Like, holy fuck. I ain't gonna lie, this is a rabbit hole that I'm 100% down for people to perpetuate until it's canonical. Leave some comments on your own contributions to this growing recontextualization of one of the most iconic kid shows. That vegan teacher miscellanea n-word. I'm gonna be so dead ass during all that vegan teacher drama I buried my head in the sand because I could not give less of a shit about that plant-based bitch. But in my understanding, vegan teacher is a, you guessed it, vegan TikTok star well known for her shitty vegan takes, like keeping her dog on a vegan diet. She's since been kicked off TikTok due to racism and homophobia, and a while back she took a doll of the black character, Miscellanea, from Daniel Tiger's neighborhood and pretended to be her to justify her use of the n-word. Understandably, this caused a lot of uproar, and now there's a petition to get PBS to sue her for copyright as a result. But yeah, that's it for this layer. I'll be back for another one now. Postcards from Buster Sugar time. In January 2005, Margaret Spellings, United States Secretary of Education, revealed that the show had explored same-sex marriage. Episode 33, Sugar Time, which features Buster visiting Heinsburg, Vermont, to learn about the production of maple sugar, includes Buster meeting several children who have lesbian parents. Vermont was one of the first states to legalize civil unions for same-sex couples. In the episode, the word lesbian or homosexual is never said. And the episode, like all postcard episodes, has no sexual content. Buster meets the children and comments, boy, that's a lot of moms. One girl mentions her mom and stepmom, adding that she loves her stepmom very much and no other comments are made about the couple. PBS Vice President of Media Relations, Leah Sloan, said at the time, the fact that there's a couple that is objectionable to the Department of Education is not at all the focus of the show, nor is it addressed in the show. Bellings demanded that PBS return all federal funding that has been used in the production of the episode, claiming that many parents would not want their young children exposed to the lifestyles portrayed in the episode. PBS decided not to air the episode, but some member stations across the country chose to air the episode, including WNET in New York City, KCET in Los Angeles, and KERA in Dallas-Fort Worth, which are flagship stations, and the show's co-producer WGBH in Boston. It was however included in both the VHS and DVD version of the collection, Buster's Outdoor Journeys, which was distributed to Paramount Home Entertainment. Some of these stations opt to air this episode in primetime, with some following the episode with a local discussion on the controversy. Shortly after the controversy, PBS the CEO announced that she would step down when her contract expired in 2006. Teletubby Cursing Doll A doll from Teletubbies was upsetting some parents. These parents claim that the dolls are teaching their children unspeakable words. Somebody from WCBS named David Diaz covered the story on the Tuesday's edition of the CBS This Morning. A doll in question is a Teletubby named Poe. Poe is one of the four Teletubby dolls that invaded the children's toy market. Diaz sat down at the time with a woman who recently purchased a Teletubby doll for her three-year-old son. When Diaz sat down with the son, he asked what he heard the doll say and the boy responded with, I squeezed it again 
and I was like, faggot. Faggot and bite my butt. The first thing I did was show my mother and father. Diaz called up the company that distributes the Teletubby dolls and they offered much different interpretations of what Poe was saying. Diaz reports, the head of the company told us the doll was not saying those things. He says the voice is a Cantonese woman saying faster, faster, and slower, slower. The head of the company felt the most important thing was to change the next batch of toys. And so they did. Barney doll stuffed with cocaine. So Barney tells millions of adoring preschoolers to use their imagination. But the six foot purple dinosaur surely never imagined that somebody would stuff him with $100,000 worth of cocaine. A drug sniffing dog detected two pounds of the drug hidden inside a talking Barney doll at a post office in Texas. Authorities allowed the package to be shipped to Minnesota, where three men were arrested. Sean Dunhow, 25, and brothers Aiden and Eden were charged in federal court with conspiracy to possess an intent to distribute cocaine. Elmo book threatens to kill you. In February 2008, after replacing the battery of an Elmo knows your name stuffed toy, the mother of two-year-old James Bowman claimed that it suddenly started saying, kill James. Melissa Bowman reported that it's not something that you really would think that would ever come out of a toy, but once I heard it, I was just just kind of distraught. The manufacturer, Fisher Price, said that Bowman would get a voucher for the replacement doll and would investigate the model to see if any other dolls had the same function and would investigate any other dolls to see if they had the same malfunction. Well, that's the end of this layer. I'm gonna give you back to the hole in my garden for layer five. I see you at layer six. Arthur Gay Wedding. This is pretty much what it says on the tin, and a lot of you are going to most likely have heard of this through osmosis. On the 13th of May 2019, an episode of Arthur aired depicting Arthur's teacher, Mr. Ratburn, marrying a man. That's pretty much all there is to the actual context. There was just a depiction of a same-sex couple on an episode of Arthur. But as minor as this moment was, it sparked a lot of controversy. You obviously had your no bullshits weighing in with their takes. But most infamously, Alabama Public Television banned the episode and chose to play a rerun instead. The excuse used by programming director Mike McKenzie said, Parents trust that young children can watch APT without their supervision, and that children younger than the target audience might watch without parental knowledge. This ban on the episode also followed Alabama placing a radical ban on abortions even in the most extreme cases. I don't want to get too political here because end of the day this is the PBS kids iceberg, not a soapbox. But to briefly say my thoughts and feelings, I don't see why anyone should give a shit about the gay rat wedding. It seemed to me like Alabama was worried that kids seeing two men getting married would rewire their little mouse brains to be gay, which is dumb. But yeah, that's my view. Next topic, the Charlie Horse Music Pizza. So this was a show that aired from January 5th, 1998 to January 17th, 1999. The show was a spin-off of Lamb Chop's Play Along and was hosted by Shari Lewis, whose strong belief in the benefits of music education for children led to the creation of the series. The show was shot at the CBC studios in Vancouver and was Shari's final project. Shari and her husband's motives for creating the show was that a third of elementary schools in the country were cutting down all music classes from their curriculum, and Shari Lewis didn't want kids to grow up without being exposed to music. Unfortunately, through production, Shari was diagnosed with inoperable uterine cancer, which led to the show being put on hold while she underwent chemotherapy. A month after her chemo treatment began, Shari died from viral pneumonia. Without her, the show was cancelled, and the day the last episode aired was on what would have been her 66th birthday. I don't really have any words for this other than just complete and utter sadness. The show creator had nothing but the best of intentions and lost it all due to tragic circumstances, leading to a show being cancelled way before her time. Lost Interstitials An interstitial is an advertisement that appears while a chosen website or page is downloading. This topic is referring to lost interstitials from a show called The Bookworm Bunch. It was a PBS kids block that ran from 2000 to 2004. It featured an array of new Nelvana produced shows based on children's books. The show's original block consisted of Timothy Goes to School, Elliot Moose, Seven Little Monsters, George Shrinks, Marvin the Tap Dancing Horse, and Corduroy. During the second season, Corduroy and Elliot Moose were removed after being cancelled. Interstitials from the 2000 to 2001 season are currently hard to find, though some have been uploaded online. Some of those known to exist feature the characters from the programming block including Timothy, Elliot Moose, The Seven Little Monsters, George Shrinks, Marvin, and Corduroy. Those that have been found are being shown on screen. Sid the Science Investigation Okay, so this is a rabbit hole of a topic that I don't really know how to adequately explain, so I'ma just pull laziness and read off an article. Accusations have been flying that the Trump presidential campaign and his assorted apparatchiks may have engaged in improper, questionable dealings with the Kremlin and Russian intelligence operatives. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but there certainly has been plenty of smoke to suggest it might be worth a peek or two into the story. There also are more than enough breadcrumbs along the trail to Trump Tower to suggest the president has done precious little to distance 
distance himself from ethical conflicts between his business empire and his job as commander-in-chief of the United States. Seems like a suitable topic for the eagle-eyed government oversight committee to explore. Alas, Chairman Chavetz, the Barney Fife of the Beltway, has scant interest in finding out if Trump is the Manchurian candidate of Mara Lagao, or if the president of the country might be more ethically conflicted than a Nebraska Avenue trollop. Instead, Chavetz had found other toils and troubles to probe. He is focused like a laser on the Jim Henson Company, those anarchists behind the Muppets, to expose the morally murky waters of Washington. According to the Washington Post, in a strongly worded letter to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Chavetz demanded it justify an $806,000 contract with the Children's Programming Company to produce a series of animated cartoons featuring one of its characters, Sid the Science Kid, to raise awareness about the Zika virus. Chavitz demanded that the agency release all written communications between the CDC and the Jim Henson Company and PBS. The inspector of the Capitol might just be onto something here. It's worth noting that Sid the Science Kid aired on PBS from 2008 to 2013. In the program, this fictional animated feign of fake news indoctrinated children about measurement, how the senses work, dental hygiene, muscles, weather, how rainbows occur, and the mystery of inertia, for which Congress itself would have been the perfect test subject. That was all from a Tampa Bay Times article, by the way. None of this was my own words. I recommend doing your own research here because I'm on a deadline. Ban Teletubbies episode. The line in the bear is one of the seven magical events. It features two characters, the scary lion with big scary teeth and the bear with the brown fuzzy hair. The two characters are both made out of wood and travel using the appearance of a skateboard and are not animated. It was the only magical event to have the characters mix along the Teletubbies as long as they did. The original sketch was first aired in 1997 in the episode Seesaw. The problems were the uncanny appearances of the characters, which are made of wood and have uncanny eyes, ears, and arms and also appear to move on their own. The scary voices, scary scenes, music, and dialogue such as I'm the bear, I'm the bear, I'm coming, and a scary voice. Therefore, a brand new edited sketch with non-scary nature and more humorous content, such as a doorbell ringing when the bear pops up behind a tree with funny piano music. The the edited sketch was first aired in the episode, Agent Storyteller. Bart Osama Bin Laden place card. So this has to do with a thing called Evil Bert. In October 2001, there was a pro Osama Bin Laden protest rally. One protester was seen holding a large collage style poster of Bin Laden with a small image of Bert on his right shoulder. After this photo released on Newswire, the owners of Sesame Street, Sesame Workshop, raised the possibility of pursuing legal action against it. The image ended up getting taken down from Sesame's workshop due to a DMCA takedown notice. Also stating that he didn't want to undermine the character's eyes and children as a terrorist. Since the original Bert slash Osama picture has been posted, it was already kind of too late and you you can now see it today. It's just a postcard with Bert and Osama Bin Laden. I guess for millennial humor, it's kind of funny. It's like a shit posty kind of funny. But back then, they didn't take it to light, especially given this was like 2001. Trey Parker and the Barney movie. So Barney's Great Adventure is a movie based on the television series. So the co-creator of South Park, Trey Parker, was offered a million and a half dollars to direct the film. After the crew saw he could do funny things with kids since he did The Spirit of Christmas, Parker declined the offer. That's kind of funny though to see a South Park guy was gonna direct the Barney movie. I actually grew up with this movie a lot, and I did a collaboration video about it. The YouTuber Checkoff27 has a video where me and him talk about the movie if you wanna go watch that. There should be a card to the right of the screen, and this should also be in the description. Go watch it, it's a funny video. Mahmoud, the Arab puppet. So Mahmoud is an Arab Israeli monster who appears on Rechav Susam, the Israel co-production of Sesame Street. Introduced in the 2006 revived series, Mahmoud. Mahmoud is a curious five-year-old. He spews Hebrew and Arabic and is a gifted drummer. He also appears in the 2010 version of Shalom Sesame, the English language US co-production with other Israeli Muppet characters. I don't know if there's much controversy with this or if it's just stating that it's that. If you know any more about this or you watched it, I guess tell me about it. But that's it for this layer. And for the last time, I'm gonna be giving this to the hole in my garden for one more layer. I'll see you in the eighth one. Sesame Street episode 847. This was a banned episode of Sesame Street that was meant to air on February 10th, 1976. In this episode, the Wicked Witch of the West, Margaret Hamilton, reprising her role from The Wizard of Oz, wreaks havoc on the street when she loses her flying broomstick. The stated curriculum goals of the episode were to demonstrate fear and the value of planning by creating and implementing methods of retrieving the broom. The episode prompted an unusually large amount of male responses from parents, almost entirely negative within a short time frame. Typical responses included parents concerned that their children were afraid and now refused to watch the show, using such phrases as screams and tears and 
The threat of the witch's power remained in children's eyes. A somewhat atypical missive came from a self-proclaimed Wiccan, concerned with the perpetuation of a negative fairy tale stereotype and recommended a segment portraying witches as they really are now. Due to the overwhelming reaction, additional test screenings were held from March 1st through the 5th to assess children's reactions to the Wicked Witch of the West. The test showed that children were exceptionally attentive during the Margaret Hamilton segments, and those who watched the episode in colour were fascinated by her green face. The issue of fear was difficult to fully judge due to confusing answers and the fact that the children were surrounded by their peers and adults and not alone watching. However, due to the parents' reactions, the letter content and testing observations, Anna Herrera of the CTW Research Department suggested that the Margaret Hamilton show not be rerun. Many years later, in November 2019, clips from the episode were screened at the Museum of the Moving Image as part of the Jim Henson Legacy's Sesame Street Lost and Found event, where former head writer Norman Stillist and current Vice President of Education and Research Rosemary Truglio discussed its educational and entertainment merits. Mr. Rogers' Conflict Mr. Rogers might just be one of the most unironically wholesome men to ever live on this planet. If you'd like a more nuanced look into why, check out the documentary Won't You Be My Neighbor. It's genuinely amazing. But yeah, I think this is referring to a banned episode. The episode in question is actually a short series of five segments, a week's worth, known as the Conflict Series that, according to Quartz, originally aired on PBS in 1983. Here's what was going on at that time. The Cold War between the United States and Russia had been rising in tension for decades. Bad shit was going on and all the while tensions appeared to be getting worse and worse. For a kid who has no comprehension of the politics and nuances behind such a thing, it left them confused and worried. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was a show that attempted to explore complicated and foreign concepts to kids in a language they could understand. King Friday, the fictional monarch of the neighborhood of make-believe, and his son, Prince Tuesday, found a package meant for another character. The monarch, a puppeted, performed, and voiced by Rogers himself, wrongly assumes the package is evidence that Corny, the neighborhood's beaver, is stockpiling bombs. This is all thanks to a history lesson they'd learn about war. King Friday pulls a US maneuver, or Russian depending on what side you're looking from, and orders his kingdom to start funneling funds into preparing for war. The show goes through a storyline that involves misunderstandings, diplomacy, and the irrational paranoia that leaders face in times of potential armed conflict. In the end, the monarchy learns that Corny's package was actually supplies needed to build a bridge. Bridge, not bomb. The episodes emerged on YouTube for a short while in 2017 before being removed by PBS for copyright violations. Barney and the Backyard Gang Terrifying Okay, so Barney and the Backyard Gang is a direct-to-video series and I think the first ever Barney show? Although that I can't be certain of. All I know is this was essentially a pilot for the full PBS show that most people are familiar with. The terrifying part of the topic's name is referring to the just awful costume they decided to use. This one looks friendly and approachable. I want to hug this friendly dinosaur and cry when he gets impaled by a lamppost. This one I want to see burned alive, leaving nothing but a trace of ash in the scorched earth. Just an awful look. But, um, yeah, that's all from me. Hopefully you've liked my layers enough to be encouraged to support me. Skipper would probably have left a link to my channel in the description. If some of you could go there, watch some of my old videos and comment on them saying your opinions, I would really appreciate it. I'm going to hand the rest of the iceberg back to Skipper now, so thank you if you've watched and liked my layers. I'm incredibly grateful. Have a nice day. Barney's Lawsuits. In 1992, Lee Bernstein contacted the Lions Partnership after she heard her song, I Love You, being used in the Barney and Friends TV series. Both Bernstein and Lions made an agreement where Lee Bernstein would get credits and royalties to the rights of all future Barney materials. Then two years later in 1994, Warren Publishing, the publisher of Piggyback Songs, filed a lawsuit and sued Lee Bernstein, Lions Partnership, Time Life Inc., EMI Records, and J.C. Penney for copyright infringement over the rights to the lyrics of I Love You. The three major projects at the time, Barney Live in New York City, Barney's Imagination Island, and Barney's Favorites Volume 2 couldn't use the song because of the active lawsuit. In December of 1994, when PBS special Barney Celebrates Children was aired, I Love You was finally sung for the first time in a while, after Warren Publishing and Lyons finally made a settlement. Barney vs. Gons In early 1993, Gons approached Lyons about becoming the Canadian mass market distributor for Barney and Baby Bob Plush. A contract dispute between Gons, a Canadian toy distributor which obtained the rights to distribute Barney and Baby Bob Plush toys in Canada from Lyons, a United 
United States Limited Partnership, which owned the intellectual property rights to use these products. There were some agreements, but there was no final written contract to which parties affixiated their signatures exist. A final draft distribution agreement to which Lyons now points as the contract was never signed by either of them. This was taken to court to a jury between August 8th and 19th, 1996 in Dallas, Texas. Gons claimed a breach of contract resulting from Lyons' alleged delay in shipping products, as well as Lyons' alleged failure in using its best efforts to protecting the Canadian toy market from infringements. While Lyons had counterclaimed that Gons had failed to take delivery and pay for 204,000 plush toys of which was obligated under the party's agreement, the jury returned its verdict on August 20th, 1996. It found that there was a breach in agreement because of the delays in the toys. It awarded Gons damage in the amount of 2,255,935 for this breach. The jury also found Gons on its failure to protect the market and claimed an award of $1,565,333 in damages. Barney versus the San Diego Chicken. In the same year where Warren Publishing sued Lyons Partnership for using I Love You song, comedy sketches of the San Diego Chicken during professional sporting events began and had the chicken beating up Barney. This pissed off Lyons a lot, and they tried to sue the guy who was playing the chicken for defamation of character, also claiming copyright and trademark infringement. Of course, this didn't go through because that's stupid, and the San Diego chicken ended up still beating up Barney, but it's a funny lawsuit. Lyons Partnership versus Costume Shops. On February 10th, 1998, Lyons Partnership sued costume renters and costume shops for offering adult-sized Barney costumes. Many people were smoking, drinking, or cursing in these costumes. They also sued Morris Costumes in 1999 for infringement of having things such as Duffy the Dragon, Purple Dino, and Hillary the Hippo, which they thought looked very similar to Barney. Teletubbies lesbian porn. So in 2001, Poo Fan Lee, who played Poe, starred in the Channel 4 drama Metrosexuality, in which she was filmed performing a sex act on another girl. And at the time, she was anything but regretful for her actions, saying she didn't do the role to be deliberately controversial. She added, yes, I was Poe, but I'm an actress too. And the role looked interesting, exciting, and challenging. That's... <laughs> I guess pretty much it. Once again, times were different back then. Nobody knows who's under the Teletubbies to begin with. People just know them as magic babies. It's kind of ridiculous. Whimsy's house lawsuit. In 2000, the Jim Henson Company issued a lawsuit against the company, saying that it violated its copyright and trademark rights on the Muppets. They denied this, but then the Jim Henson Company kept pursuing. Cheryl Leach's son shot someone. The son of the creator of Barney and Friends was sentenced to 15 years in prison for shooting a Malibu neighbor. City News Service said at the time a 29-year-old Patrick Leach was sentenced to Wednesday for a 2013 attack. At the time, he pleaded no contest and made to the assault of a semi-automatic firearm and shooting from a motor vehicle. Leach then drove off, leaving Amanda bleed in his driveway. Luckily, someone heard the gunshots, wrote down the license plate of the fleeing vehicle, and helped save the victim by stemming the bleeding. The shocking incident began with Leach driving next door, honking his horn and accusing his neighbor of trespassing. The argument arose and escalated, leading Leach to fire multiple times, according to the prosecutors. I heard him yelling, Hey, I've been shot, a Samaritan said in 2013. The neighbor was shot once in the chest and a round exited through his shoulder. When police arrested Leach, he was wearing body armor and carrying weapons. Jeez, I guess, okay. Well, I guess that's the end of this layer. Let's head on to the next one. When it comes to outrage, parents of toddlers know how to make themselves heard. This relates to a teacher named Miss Martinez who was allegedly fired. As the controversy has escalated, Miss Martinez, a 34-year-old New York actress who is married and a mother of three, started a discussion of freedom of speech. The host of The Good Night Show, a block evening from Dragon Tales, Bob the Builder, and Thomas and Friends, Miss Martinez introduced cartoons and demonstrated arts and crafts between the segments. Kevin Clash Child Sex Abuse Allegations In November 2012, 23-year-old Sheldon Stevens alleged that he had been in a sexual relationship with Clash that began when Stevens was 16. Sesame worked Workshop had initially been presented in the allegation in June, and its investigation found the allegation to be substantiated. Class acknowledged that he'd been in a relationship with the accuser, however, he said the relationship was between consenting adults. Two weeks later, another accuser, Cecil Singleton, made similar accusations, and lawsuits were filed by attorney Jeffrey Herman against Clash. Clash resigned from Sesame Workshop on November 20, 2012, and released a statement saying, Personal matters have diverted attention away from the important work Sesame Street is doing, and I cannot allow it to go on any longer. I am deeply sorry to be leaving and looking forward to resolving the personal matters privately. Sesame Workshop also released a statement, Unfortunately, the controversy surrounding Kevin's personal life has become a distraction that none of us want, and he has concluded that he can no longer be effective in his job and has resigned from Sesame Street. They stated that the other puppeteers have been trained to serve at Clash's understudy and would take over his roles in the show. In 2013, the three cases of Clash were dismissed, because the claims were made six years after what was alleged that happened. David Yoiner, Sex Guru So the lead actor on Barney became a sex guru. His statement, The 
imagery I brought while in costume was based on the foundation of Tantra, which is love. Yoiner 54 told Vice. Everything stems and grows and evolves from love. Love heals and allows you to continue to grow, but it appears to veer in potentially illegal territory. Billing himself a Tantra message specialist and spiritual healer, he charges 30 female-only clients, $350 for sessions that last only three to four hours, according to Vice. He provides ritual baths, chakra, balancing messages, and sex to release blocked energy. He said before he went into the costume, he would pray to God about his loving divine spirit to flow through him in the costume that would let him draw kids. The energy would also draw them in, Yoiner said. Children are more connectionally spirited than adults. A lot of times when I see infants, I'm out at the grocery store or whatever, they start staring at me. I make the joke, you know who I am. The big controversy stated by a defense attorney was that you can't legally have sex with anybody for exchange of money, he said. Jared Nathan's death. Jared Nathan was an American actor from Nashua. Jared Nathan was an American actor from New Hampshire. He starred on the first season of the revival PBS Kids television show, Zoom. He left the show after season one ended. He died from injuries in a car crash on December 28, 2006, when the car in which he was a passenger in hit a tree. He was 21 years old, and an episode of Jeopardy was dedicated to him in his memory. Jacqueline Linsky death. On September 8, 2013, at the age of 17, she was heading towards set for a show she was in. She was killed instantly following the collision. Prisoner kills molesters watching PBS Kids. So a California prisoner has confessed to beating two child molesters to death because one of them was watching PBS Kids in jail. Jonathan Watson. 41 made the confession in a letter to the Mercury News where he claimed he warned prison officials about what was going to happen, but was ignored. In the letter, he claimed he had been recently moved from a secure single-person cell to a communal one. Hours before the attack, he told prison counselors he urged to nearly put him back in isolation before, I really fuck up one of these dudes. But the counselors scoffed and dismissed him. Now that's the end of the iceberg, though. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching the video. If you made it this far, consider subscribing. We're getting close to 50K and that would be really appreciated. Also, I really suggest you watch my other videos. I put a lot of effort into those ones. Who knows, you might even enjoy them. Also, once again, thanks to the whole of my garden. He's a good guy. And if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. Once again, thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. I'm Dr. Skipper and I'll see you soon. I chain smoke till I choke.